Today I'm joined by Kai Uwe Bergman. He's a senior partner at the architectural practice of Big. He works out of New York, uh, but obviously operating globally. Now, uh, Kai, uh, you've been very involved with resiliency plans in New York. Um, the word takes on a broader meaning now in a post COVID-19 environment. So will our current experience make us all more aware of the fragility of our occupation of this planet and thus ensure that the much greater danger of climate catastrophe ensures that zero carbon is at the top of the global agenda as we come out of this? It, it's uh, one of the first things that I felt as uh, we were entering into the sort of quarantine phase is how resiliency is actually getting a much deeper meaning, not just sort of climactic stresses or economic stresses, but really getting to the core, I think, of, of just how we think of both the planetary systems, our own uh, urban systems, and how even cities interact with nature and with, with the rural. This is a, a sort of game-changing event in our lives. It's also, I think, one that has connected us hum as humanity across cultural borders, geopolitical borders, and, and sees that we can actually have, in essence, a sort of a common cause to start navigating uh, the future. I think that climate catastrophe, uh, that too is a common cause that binds us all. Of course, we should be starting our own plans, regional plans, uh, cross-border plans, in order to deal with these issues. But I think that we can take what we've learned and the kind of actions that we will need to take to come out of uh, this uh, pause, this time out in our lives, and then use those same kind of systems and tools and energy and focus on the broader issues of climate. I was watching a, a video of you talking about Master Planet, a Master Plan for the Planet, uh, which reminded me rather of Buckminster Fuller's World Design Science Decade, uh, where, where he wanted architects to come together to look at the resources of the world and how we could make them function better. So how, how are your ideas for the Master Planet going? And uh, does that involve others or is this is really a, a big project? Bjarke actually did start to talk about Master Planet in uh, recent lectures. We very much uh, are working on it as a research project, uh, as we do on several issues all the time. Master Planet uh, is uh, still, I would say, in its uh, infancy. We're still, in a way, figuring it out ourselves. And the hope is actually to start uh, sharing uh, the thoughts of Master Planet and engaging others and seeing it as a kind of open source network of ideas that others can then also come in and, and build upon. The trajectory for, for releasing, I think, the ideas surrounding Master Planet are in many ways uh, going to be initially in our next publication called Form Giving, which is uh, built on an exhibition that we started in the Danish Architecture Center. And I think that that, that exhibition were some of the seeds that have uh, asked us to think about the very systems that I mentioned earlier that are you know, no longer just national systems like freeways or broadband internet or, um, or flood management systems, that these are systems that do go uh, across borders and that we really need to start, start to think about actually um, how we could uh, start designing those systems uh, in a very, very sort of meaningful way. Um, <laughs> so I'm now uh, being intruded upon similar to, uh, here, here's the reason that we should be thinking about uh, the future uh, and, and the sort of the families. Um, so thank you, Amelie. So we, we hope very much with both uh, the publication of the book and with the exhibition going to Milan uh, to start to share this um, and, and have others contribute uh, in the future. Well, hopefully uh, when we're out of lockdown, we can go and look at exhibitions again. But also, uh, BIG are working with Toyota on the Woven City project. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And is its aim to provide 
wider solutions for cities or this is aimed specifically at solutions for Toyota? First off, Toyota uh, was not a car manufacturing uh, company to begin with. Um, it was a loom company. Uh, they made looms, industrial looms. So uh, the idea of Woven City is actually to realize that a company like Toyota actually had pivoted uh, in its past and gone from uh, sort of loom manufacturing, learned from that, and then moved that uh, into the uh, it, it, sort of an industrialized car manufacturing company. So um, now they are sitting at a point where they're also realizing that the future is no longer about creating cars as products. Uh, they see car driving as a shared service so that in the future, um, it's less about making cars and it's going to be more about uh, thinking about autonomous technologies. So Toyota Woven City is really about creating laboratories. Right now as a prototype, it'll be the laboratory that we're designing uh, in, in uh, outside of Tokyo, north of Tokyo. Uh, but they do have plans of actually taking this uh, into their other plants. So if you imagine that Toyota is a global car manufacturer, they own a lot of property and, and plants and have plants in different places. They would like to bring this laboratory of thinking and engaging with others um, at the same time. So in addition to the architectural project that was made public, they also made public a, uh, an, a, a sort of uh, investment fund of $100 million for uh, future uh, technologies. And if you're a company that's looking for uh, some seed investment, you are able to actually ask Toyota to help you fund the ideas that would then be integrated into the coming Toyota Woven City. So uh, it was really one of the first times in which I saw um, not only there to be sort of a spatial idea and a spatial kind of plan, but one that also had a funding plan that went with it. And I, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's very uh, interesting and meaningful that Toyota could see itself pivoting in the future uh, to uh, becoming more than what we think of Toyota today. I think after uh, this uh, crisis and we are likely to be looking at a period of uh, some frugality and economic restraint. Uh, does that mean the, the end of funny shaped buildings as uh, President Jiaoping uh, might have said in the past? When funny shaped buildings mean uh, I think a sort of baroque uh, sort of flamboyance, I think yes. I think that we are perhaps looking at a point where things have to have meaning, mm -hmm. uh, a meaning of moving towards a, a sort of better or greater good. Uh, but I don't think that funny shaped buildings that are funny shaped because they are actually trying to achieve other, other uh, uh, sort of challenges means that we don't see, we, that we only live in a world of sort of boxes. If you think of Singapore as a, a country and also an urban environment where there's incredible, uh, I think, experimentation, there's, there's a sort of prototyping uh, ways for nature and the built environment to kind of coexist. There were, you know, the, the, the congestion pricing that we're only now introducing into Europe and into the Western world. Uh, was already existent in Singapore 25 years ago. So I do think that I, I go around Singapore and I'm often inspired by uh, the kind of large leaps of thinking that have occurred there urbanistically. And my hope is that we take those same leaps also in our neighborhood. And talk, talking ab about leaps, I mean, one of the uh, big projects that you've been working is uh, creating a more resilient uh, New York. Can you tell us a little bit more just what, what the big U is? The big U is, uh, and, and it reminds me that, you know, we've been here the, the sort of nine years. Um, we, we really have gone through two crises already in our, you know, short period of time. Uh, we arrived in the financial crisis, uh, sort of 2010. That was the lowest point, if you look back now, uh, through uh, sort of 2020 vision. We didn't know that at the time. We, we just came here and uh, started the office uh, at that point in time. 
Uh, we then also, uh, just two years later, went through the Superstorm Sandy, which came up through uh, New York. It could have been a lot worse, but it actually did cause nearly $20 billion of damage to the city and 200,000 New Yorkers were homeless. The, these crises, both the financial crisis of, of sort of nine to 10 years ago and the, um, and the crisis of the climactic crisis, these are moments where you suddenly do have uh, the ability to change how people work or how people think, make decisions. And so climate change was actually not in the lexicon of either the governor or the mayor at the time. They didn't uh, have any programs. Uh, they didn't have any ideas for uh, resiliency in New York at that time. So when Sandy happened, it was an international uh, uh, competition. And we were lucky enough to be one of uh, six funded projects. It was a very interesting process. Um, and we looked at New York City, Manhattan, uh, and looked at a 10-mile stretch of the coastline, looking at it geologically, where the low points were. And what was interesting to see is that the parts of New York that flooded were exactly the outline of Manhattan at the time uh, of, of the 1600s, when people came over on the Mayflower and, and sort of started to inhabit the, the east coast of the United States. So what it tells you is that, you know, the areas that were flooded were actually man-made uh, and were infill. And so it was and, and continues to be very much how we interact, the sort of Anthropocene, you know, layer of seeing how we change coastlines and that we then change systems. So Canal Street was actually a canal, a natural inlet for water. Water Street which is now two blocks inland, was actually the edge of the harbor. Um, and so when you start to realize that the water is only returning back to its original state, do you begin to then understand, you know, how do we think both in terms of protection, but also maybe to, to sort of in some areas uh, recede? And this is this balancing act, I think, that we went through the last um, six, seven years with the big U is finding that balance between what to protect and where to receive. And how are things going in London? What, what are your projects over here? London for us has been a, a, a really wonderful place. Uh, believe it or not, we've, we've grown actually from originally about 15 uh, bigsters in London in 2016 to about 65 now. For, for us, the, the work has been both in, in finally realizing our collaboration with uh, Thomas Heatherwick at King's Cross, the Google King's Cross, and that is finally coming out of the ground. That's a very large scale project that required a lot of effort uh, to go through planning commission. We are, however, also working in a, in a variety of different cities across the UK. Kai, thank you very much indeed uh, for your, your comments and uh... Uh, best of luck as New York comes out of uh, lockdown, and I look forward to uh, meeting up soon. Peter, I also uh, would like to thank you, and, and I look to you as also being a leader in helping us all understand uh, the current state of things and uh, how we can perhaps pivot to a better world in the future. Thank you very much. Bye.